Good morning. My, I'm glad we, you got here early. <laughs> Get a good seat. <laughs> well, it's so good to be back together again, and, uh, uh, and then I want to welcome all those that are on Facebook and watching either this morning or a little later on. Marianne and I are leaving tomorrow for vacation. Uh, we're going to spend a week, part of it, uh, in a lodge, um, hopefully with not too many other people. And uh, we're going to then come home and uh, probably do nothing for a few days. But So Mike has uh, so graciously agreed to preach for you next Sunday, and um, so we look forward to that. So thank you, Mike. Let's worship together. Good morning to everyone, all five or six of us. <laughs> and we all know that, that you're always welcome here. Wherever you are, wherever you are in your life's journey, you're welcome at St. John's. Does anybody have an announcement? Silence. Then let us prepare ourselves for worship. Bless God, O oh friends, with all your strength. Bless his holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. Bless God, O oh friends, with all our strength. Bless the holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. Forgiveness flowing into healing, tireless goodness and joy, strength and 
you the eagle of flight. Bless God, O oh friends, and all our strength, with all our strength, bless his name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. Vindication, justice for all those oppressed, liberation from bondage, and guidance for the way. Unending mercy, steadfast love. Bless God, O oh friends, with all our strength. Bless the holy name. Bless God, O friends, and never forget God's gifts. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who are faithful. As a parent has compassion for children, so our God has compassion for us. Bless God, O friends, with all our strength. Bless the holy name. Bless God, O friends, and never forget God's gifts. Compassionate one, lover of goodness, patience with sinners, draw near to us, surround us with confidence in your good news that you love us as parents love their children, that your mercy is boundless and generous, that you beckon us always and will ne wait forever as we find our way back to you. Open our hearts to receive your compassion and then show us to forgive that we may be vessels of resurrection, hope in our troubled world, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you ever look at the hymnal, you'll find that there are not very many hymns dedicated to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, but this one is, O Spirit of the Living God. And it says, O Spirit of the Living God, thou light and fire divine, descend upon thy church once more and make it truly thine. Fill it with love and joy and power, with righteousness and peace, till Christ shall dwell in human hearts and sin and sorrow cease. Well, I was going to change horses in midstream here, but I can't find my other horse. So um, today I have my grandma's favorite old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. And then I, I don't, there aren't probably many of you in here who remember Margaret Fawcett, who was a longtime member of St. John's many years ago. Her favorite hymn was I Sing a Song of the Saints of God. And then one of my favorites from the Black Hymnal, Won't You Let Me Be My Servant? Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant?
Thanks so much, Jenny, for, for those hymns and reminders. I um, don't know whether you have prayer requests. Be thinking about that just a moment. I just want us to be in remembrance and prayer um, for all of the people in the western part of our country who are suffering so severely with fire and loss. And then the anniversary of 9-11. Um, I heard this past week, I think, I, I think this is true, that um, one-fourth of our population has no memory of 9-11. One-fourth of our population. Think of that. I mean, when um, just it dates us a bit, doesn't it? But I remember that time, and I'm sure you may too, of what you were doing and where you were and those images that we saw on the television and so on and how incredibly powerful they were. Let's remember um, the people on our prayer list, um, Joyce Heffelfinger and Jenny's sister, M. I'd like for us to continue to remember Barb Neer, who has transferred to a care facility in Fort Wayne. And um, just to continue to remember to um, Colleen's aunt. And do you have any further word on her? Well, often I think about that and those situations and people making that transition. And I have another friend who is uh, despairing of living. And so in that time of dealing with life and death, uh, as we all will be one day, I'd invite us to pray together. Today, loving God, we are reminded again of that day 19 years ago when those towers in New York City came down. And every time we think about that, we are reminded and our minds are boggled by such evil in the world that can snuff out the lives of so many people who were absolutely innocent of any, anything that might have been done to offend those who did the evil. We have no way to wrap our minds around the violence in this world that's created, a world that's created by God and inhabited by God and a loving God, and yet we experience evil like that. And we still say today that we don't understand when injustice and years of inequality lead not to constructive encounter and hard conversation, but to violence that wounds and kills and destroys. So all around us, we face that problem and we don't know what to do with it or how to even think about it. But we can only plead for your great wisdom and compassion to somehow move upon us, us individually, us as a community, and us as a country these days. Move upon our hearts and make a difference in, in us so that we as people and we as a nation can be begin to learn how to heal with justice and mercy and understanding and not by creating more pain and suffering and loss. And so I ask that you would do a work inside of us 
to touch our own prejudices and fear and anger and replace them with a tender heart to suffering. That we may be aware and, and know that suffering and care and reach out to the best of our ability in compassion. And then give us ears to hear and open hearts. I ask that you'd keep us alert to what we can do right here in this place, in St. John's, in this community, in our neighboring communities, to be a people of understanding and of mercy and justice. Help us to be alert to those things. And we wouldn't want to forget to ask for your mercy toward all of those who have lost so much these days because of the ravages of fire in our country. You're the infinite one. And our minds are so tied to today and the things that we can touch. You've given us hearts that can be broken. And so surely you too feel our pain as your children. And we count on you being able to feel our pain as a loving parent. And thank you for it. And I pray that you will hear the names of those in our midst that need your prayers, your tender care, Joyce Heffelfinger and M. Finney, Barb Near, Colleen's Aunt Vicki, to all the Wilson children. And again today, we ask that you would touch them and that you would tune our hearts always to be grateful. Grateful to you and grateful to each other. Give us kind hearts. And may our words to one another be uplifting and encouraging and healing. And so this morning, listen to your children as we the pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is a very familiar story to us, and you're going to hear the full uncondensed version. It takes a little while, so get comfortable. Uh, this is a story of uh, the Israelites fleeing the Egyptians. Uh, and keep in mind as you listen to this that they needed to cross the Red Sea, and they were traveling from east to west. So when you hear these directions in here, you can sort of, you know, put a picture into it. Uh, it's from uh, Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground. Excuse me, uh, went into the, on the dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, 
all the Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord uh, tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walk on dry ground throughout the area, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This ends the reading, but if you want to find out more, read on in chapter 15. There's a a long uh, hymn that they sang in uh, thanks for what had just happened. You might enjoy it. Thank you. That, um, that's, uh, thank you for reading all of that, and thanks for um, uh, reminding us of that next chapter as well. And I uh, really appreciate that. It's probably one of the more familiar events out of the Old Testament. I would like to, before I begin, to um, just spend a moment or two in silence, honoring that spirit within us who wants to teach this morning. Well, I don't know how you're going to feel, uh, and, and maybe it's a mix this morning among you all about the conclusion of this sermon, sermon series on politics and the spirit, as spirituality and the, um, the politics as the um, spirituality of practice. It's trying to think how I had it listed. Um, um, We'll see what I preach about this morning if I can't remember the title. This has been a this has been a very a big sermon series for me, and I'm glad for your patience, or endurance, or maybe it's been good for you. Um, but I've been trying to highlight this role that I see, think that uh, the spiritual part of us ought to take in every dimension of our lives, including politics. And I've focused on this responsibility that we have as citizens and how I believe that we ought to be called regularly by the church, not to vote in any particular way, but regularly called by the church, by our place that we gather to help to reinforce our spiritual life, and called by them to be responsible to bring what the values and uh, uh, the spiritual dimension of our life into our political, uh, civic life. And, but, but it's broader than how we act at the polls. It's how we act everywhere in our lives. And I wanted to make that connection that how we act in politics, in, in, in voting, and how we act in our political life 
is just another dimension of being Christian in the world. And uh, maybe it's all things that you didn't need reminding of, but so whatever I say about political activities is applicable to every other kind of activity that you do, everything else that you do in your life. I want to simplify things and just say that to make up the whole of who we are, we've got two parts. This is um, way simplifying the whole thing, but maybe you'll get it. There's two parts of us. There's a natural part of us, and there's a spiritual part of us. The natural part is all the tangible things that, are, that we do and that we have in our lives. Just things like, you know, it's uh, the, our dealings about our house, about our family, about our money, our job, and the schools, and all of that. Basically, these are the things that you can see and touch and count. And you can add them up and come up with the totals. Spiritual things, however, are the intangible parts of our lives, not the measurable things. They're things like our relationship to God, primarily, but it's also our relationship to other people is part of our spiritual life. The things that we love and the things that we don't are part of our spiritual life, immeasurable, not concrete. The things that we value or don't value are a part of our spiritual life. The things that have meaning to us, our morals, our religion, our character, all these are a part of that spiritual dimension of life. And it feels sometimes like we get divided into those two components. I want you to imagine something with me for a, a moment. I want you to imagine what it would be like that if for some reason something happened in the whole of the universe and the spiritual part of us were just removed, totally gone. All we've got left is the concrete, physical, natural part of us and our world. Suddenly, suddenly, in our world, we're living in a world where there is no sense of right and wrong. What would that be like? How would that kind of a world be for you? What do you think about? If there were no values, there were no love, no hate, no religion, no inner voice, no conscience, nothing holy or sacred, what would that do for your life personally? What would it do for the communities we live in and for the country? And what would it be like for politics and the way we govern ourselves? All right, make it concrete. You encounter a traffic law, let's say, the stop sign. There is no moral compunction to obey the traffic light. There is no sense of responsibility, because this is spiritual, there's no sense of responsibility for the wounds that you might inflict on other people. What's going to get you to stop at the stoplight? You never read the Bible. You never feel an obligation to seek or connect in any way with God or the divine because for you, none of that exists. All only the natural world. And there's never sense in your life that you are standing on holy ground. Do you have those moments? Have you had them? I'm sure you have in your lifetime where some moment, some encounter has just so impacted you that you felt like in a moment, for some reason, almost inexplicable, that you have been transferred from 
the world of the natural world to a world of the spirit and you feel you're on holy ground. You come across somebody outside of your clan and there is no restraint that keeps you from attacking that other either verbally or otherwise. Your business dealings are without any compunction to honor your word or speak the truth about what you want to sell. Can you imagine a world like that? It's really frightening, if you think about it, that that could happen or that we could even imagine it. Our lives are so intertwined with more than just brick and mortar and dollars and cents. And over the years, over history, this balance between the spiritual and the natural or the spiritual and the physical has shifted in the country and in our world so that sometimes one is greater than the other, sometimes it's not. But it seems to me that in the last years, the spiritual has more or less suffered a loss such that the only measures of our actions and our choices is what do I gain, what's the profit, how much more influence or power will I have if I make this choice or that choice, and not what's right, what is loving, what would build our community, and what does God want for us. I'm not saying that it's absent. Thank God it's not absent. I'm just saying that as I look at the world and the interactions of the world, read my paper and watch the news on the computer or wherever I get it, it just seems to me it boggles my mind sometimes. And I say to myself, how can they do that? How can they be so destructive and hurtful? And where is the conscience? Where is that spiritual compunction to do the right thing? And my messages over the past few weeks have been about this, about this balance that we keep where we pay attention to the physical because it's important. We have to have food on the table and all those kind of things are very important, but this spiritual dimension has to have at least an equal part to our lives to balance and to keep us in order. And the key thing to me in this whole, ex uh, whole uh, uh, adventure of exploring this topic is that the balance is largely up to us because we choose where that balance will be. We choose whether or not to pay attention and listen to the spirit as well as we listen to all of the natural impulses and desires that are all, that are many of them very good. But we choose whether we listen to the spirit or not. We put our foot on the scales, the balance scales and tip it however it suits us and we have that choice as human beings and we can tip it back again. And it is my concern that we do our part to bring that balance where the spiritual is being considered by our country and by our communities more and more these days. That's why I argue for an integration of that higher or divine part of our nature and all over and all of that uh, uh, natural routine activities of life should be balanced with that word of the spirit. That's why every Sunday I call us to listen to this right now to that spirit that wants to teach us. And that just includes how we vote and how we act in our political life. No party no one side of the political aisle has a corner of, on spirituality in this nation. I don't believe that. No party 
has a corner on spirituality. But it's our job to decide which one better lives out in practice what we believe to be the highest calling of God for ourselves. And that's, to me, how God is involved in politics. It isn't a matter of how you vote and how I vote. It is a matter of what we keep in mind and what are the reasons and what are the things that influence us as we vote. And it's no light responsibility. A friend of mine, uh, I should say he's a friend because I really like what he writes, Parker Palmer has written a book called The Healing of uh, the Heart and Soul of Democracy. And I listened to him speak at a conference and he talked about our responsibility as citizens to bring that spiritual part into our political life and integrate the two. And it's no light matter. If we don't do it, who will? It is no simple matter. And we are not going to agree how it's done. But if we all listen to the spirit, it'll be just fine. And it won't matter, really, in the long haul. Who wins or what party comes out on top if we mind the spirit inside of us? We are guardians of that careful integration of the spiritual with the natural. I can assure you that it matters what you do. Now, I want to go back to that text this morning that Caroline just read for us. Actually, I may go back, I'm going to go back a little bit further than what that passage that she wrote, read for you, and I want to read for you a little bit that just came just before that. It's a truly amazing story, that crossing of the Red Sea. That story along with the story of the miraculous escape from Egypt, has become one of the pivotal and defining stories for the Jewish people. They go back to it often celebrated annually, and for Christians too. It's a story of the intersection of the natural world and the world of the spirit. It's that blending, and you see it right there in that story, that great moment in that story. And as we talk about this, you can get all caught up in the scientific things, and you can ask all kinds of questions about the crossing of the Red Sea, and they're all valid questions, and it's fun probably to talk about them, but we're never going to get good answers because, as far as I know, even though we're all very old, we aren't that old. And so we never were there, and we can't ever, any one of us say, I saw it myself, and I know how it happened. But if you only think about that physical part of it, the scientific part of it, you're going to miss such an important thing. I want you to get the dilemma that the people of Israel found themselves in, and that's what I think the story is all about, is that dilemma. In this moment, here we are confronted with physical, natural realities, and the predicament that they present themselves to us, and the spiritual. And what are we going to do with that choice between those two things? And where are we going to put our weight and our confidence? The part of the story that happened just before what Caroline read to you is this, and it explains the predicament. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled out of Egypt, the Israelites, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariots made ready, and he took his army with him. Now, I don't know how many Israelites they were, but remember, they were slaves in Egypt. So you can just imagine how armed they were when they fled to get out of their life of servitude. And Pharaoh gets his whole army together. He took 600 of his best chariots, 
along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea. I could name the sea, but I can't pronounce it. <laughs> the Israelites fleeing for their lives, for their freedom. Slaves led by Moses get out of Egypt barely by the skin of their teeth and Pharaoh, after all the plagues, remember, finally says, go ahead and go and get out of my sight. They get out of his sight and he changes his mind. He gets the whole troops together and he pursues them. And they get themselves locked into a bind. The Red Sea is in front of them. All the chariots of Egypt is, are behind them. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? That's the thanks he got for being a leader and delivering them. They said, what's the deal here? How did you do this? You don't care at all for us. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. That's the dilemma. And all the Israelites could see was the physical, natural reality. That's it. And Moses answered the people, boy, this takes courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Have you been in that situation where the word, don't be afraid, seemed as absurd to you? Don't be sad. Don't be afraid. Don't be worried. As absurd to you as that word must have been to the Israelites. I tell you, this is not a story out of history books. This is a story of people. This is our story. I've been there. The Egyptians were coming up from behind, but it was of a different name than that. And the Red Sea was in front of me, and it had a different name than that. But I have faced those moments when it looked like, from every standpoint, naturally, that there was no way out. Don't be afraid, Moses said. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. That spiritual dimension. The Egyptians will see today, the Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Have you ever heard a still small voice that maybe it was louder say to you, calm down, it'll be okay. Because you don't know everything by just what you see and what you touch. The spirit is involved here. You can add up the facts and it looks like the end of this is going to be your circumstances one and you zero. And unless there is more to life than these natural realities around you, you're going to be toast. Caroline read, and I don't know if you picked it up, 
But all along the Israelites' journey, it said there was this little cloud that trailed behind them. And if you read the text carefully, in this time when they were facing the Red Sea with the Egyptians behind them, that on the, between them and the Egyptians was this little cloud. What a silly thing. What's a little cloud? I'll tell you what the little cloud is. It is this vague, faint reminder that the world isn't just physical. There is a spiritual dimension. Remember the cloud. Don't forget the cloud. And at that moment, you have a choice. This is the kind of moment we have all the time in our life, all the time. And all I've been saying to you in the last four weeks is you have that moment when you vote, you've got that moment when you encounter everybody else in the community, you have that moment at your home all the time, you've got this moment. Is this all there is what I see with my eyes or is there a cloud? And all I have to do is be still. We always have that choice, and at every moment we choose again whether to live as though with we are only a, the sum of our, the minerals and the chemicals that make up our bodies or whether we're spiritual beings under the direct influence of the Holy Spirit of God. If we decide for the latter, then how we behave and what directions we take and where our loyalties lie, lie must be the result of yielding our will to the vision of God. And that applies whether we're negotiating a business deal, where we're talking to our children, or whether we're talking to our children about their performance in school, whether we're in a conflict with our spouse or our friend, or whether we're standing in the voting booth deciding where to put our mark. It's the same thing everywhere. And this is what matters when it comes to healing the soul of America. And it matters whether we're Democrat or Republicans. Today, now, what should I do? How shall I think about this? According to my best ability and insight to allow the Holy Spirit of God to live and act in and through me. May God give us all wisdom and courage. Amen. Like Paul, who was showered with an abundance of mercy from God, we too have been blessed. Like Paul, we are called to go forth and witness to the presence of Christ in our lives in so many diverse ways. One of the ways in which we tell the story is through the giving of gifts to God. In our gift giving, we participate with God in providing for the needs of God's people.
we dedicate to you, generous God, our lives. Receive these offerings as our sign of gratitude and commitment. Amen. You may be seated. I ask Jenny to uh, play a African American spiritual, and I don't have the music, and therefore I don't have the words. And guess what? They appeared. That's what I'm telling you about the spiritual. It just, you know, happened. This one's called, maybe you've heard it, and maybe it'll be familiar as she plays it, Wade in the Water. And like spirituals, it has a repetition and, and a tune that's uh, catching. Wade in the water, children, wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Who's that yonder dressed in red? God's going to trouble the water. Must be the children that Moses led. God's going to trouble the water. Who's that yonder dressed in white? God's going to trouble the water must be the children of the Israelites. God's going to trouble the water. Who's that yonder dressed in blue? God's going to trouble the water. Must be the children. Now let them through. God's going to trouble the water. Well, I can say go in peace because there's a cloud behind you and it's not the cloud that was over the head of um, what's uh, the Linus mm, character Pigpen. Uh, it's the cloud that says that the spirit is here and what you see is not the only reality. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> 